Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Asma Shindi, petroleum engineer graduated from American University of Ras al Khaima. On behalf of Biopetro Arab Oil and Gas Academy, I would like to welcome all of you to the third session of our short course, Field Development Geomechanics, presented by distinguished speaker, Dr. Hamid Surush. Our course is for webinars, four quizzes, and a final exam. Certificates are provided if you have scored higher than 70% of the total grade. Before I present our speaker, I would like to, to remind you, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and keep the chat box professional. Now, our speaker is Dr. Hamid Surush. He is an internationally recognized geomechanics expert with more than 25 years of experience in geomechanics applications. He has conducted or managed more than 250 consulting and research projects worldwide. Dr. Hamid is currently the CEO of PetroLearn LLC with the objective to apply learning from oil and gas to accelerate movement toward clean energy. Dr. Hamid holds Bachelor in, Ma in Mining Engineering, Master's in Rock Mechanics and PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Curtin University in Australia. He has been selected as SPE Distinguished Lecturer in 2012, 2017 and 2020. Today's session is about drilling geomechanics. So please pay attention and welcome Dr. Hamid Surush. Dr. Hamid, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Asma. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, have the third session of the Field Development Geomechanics course. Uh, people who were in the last two sessions, uh, uh, we actually covered a little bit of theory and, and uh, fundamental, basically, uh, part of geomechanics, uh, the, the theories that are needed to actually understand the applications and uh, geomechanical modeling. Uh, we also talked about uh, rock property modeling, how we can get <clears throat> rock properties from the, uh, the lab or uh, how we can estimate these basically important rock properties uh, from logs. So uh, we are following a workflow for geomechanical modeling. Uh, uh, the next step actually in the workflow after rock property modeling is pore pressure prediction. So this session, uh, we cover pore pressure prediction and we also do uh, stress modeling, including uh, overburden or vertical stress modeling and the minimum horizontal stress. So the maximum horizontal stress and some of the applications will be covered uh, last session next week. So, so with that said, let's see what uh, pore pressure is. Basically, uh, when we are talking about subsurface formations, we have a, uh, a matrix of, of basically solids. Uh, there are different mineral mineralogy, different uh, uh, grains of basically rock with different uh, compositions. And then there are uh, uh, basically the pore spaces. There are voids, which actually are uh, between this, this uh, solid part. And this can be in the in form of you know, uh, pore spaces or uh, micro fractures or fractures that basically create uh, a space for uh, for formation to be saturated with a fluid. That typically this fluid can be either uh, water, brine, um, oil, or gas. Uh, so. Uh, since these basically fluids are uh, constrained in the, the formation and below the surface, so they, they typically have a uh, pressure. So that pressure is called pore pressure. So pore pressure is basically the pressure uh, exists in the in the fluid that uh, has been basically have, uh, is, is filling the the pore space in the in the formation. So. Uh, Typically, if this basically fluid are uh, communicating to the uh, free water level at the, either at the surf at, at the water table or uh, at the sea level, if we are offshore, we call this as basically pore pressure regime normal. So we say that you know pore pressure is in the normal regime. So it means that uh, all the formations from from top to the to the basically uh, formation we are looking at, they are all communicating and in, in connection with each with each other. So. Uh, there are a few actually terms definition that I want to uh, 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 explain here. So we talked about the normal pore pressure. So basically when there, there is a, 
uh, no uh, abnormally you no know, increase in the in the proportion of the formations apart from the the dead weight of the fluid actually or uh, height of the fluid on top of the formation we are looking at right so now if if we face a formation that the the pore pressure inside them actually goes above the normal uh, pore pressure, right? Those formations are called either abnormal pressure or high pore pressure formations. Uh, and there are formations that uh, actually the pore pressure might be below the normal uh, pore pressure, maybe call them subnormal. And a typical example of them are uh, basically depleted you know, reservoirs. And uh, we also have uh, typically overpressure, uh, which is the, uh, sorry, overburden, which is the vertical stress, is the dead weight of the, the formations on top of basically uh, each formation we are looking at. So these are the main basically uh, definitions that we need to know when we talk about pore pressure. Just quickly talking about the normal pressure of different fluids. Uh, for example, if all the uh, formations from the uh, surface to the basically subsurface are filling with fresh water. We, I mean, the, the gradient of the uh, normal pore pressure regime is typically, you know, or, or 1 SG uh, or you know, 0 0.43 uh, PSI per foot or 8.34 uh, PPG. As you see, there are different basically units that uh, industry is using for uh, pore pressure gradients. So it depends which region you are working on, you might actually have a preferred one, but uh, uh, I'm putting all the numbers here, you, you guys can correlate with, so. Uh, but you know, typically we don't have fresh water uh, in the subsurface formation, the water is typically uh, have salinity. So uh, we are dealing with brine or saline uh, fluid, which are heavier than the fresh water. So these are the typical numbers for, uh, for brine. And uh, when we get into the reservoir, uh, typically uh, we have either oil or gas or combinations. So these are the typical ranges of the normal uh, pressure gradient uh, for oil and, and gas. Uh, so as you see, you now water is uh, uh, heavier than, than oil, oil is heavier than, than gas. So if we have, uh, if we can profile the uh, basically pressure in different fluids, uh, we will come up with basically uh, pore pressure profiles with different uh, gradient or different steep, right? Uh, and this is this is a way to to find the uh, uh, you know either uh, gas oil content or or oil water content surfaces. So, uh, but uh, as I said, these are all normal basically pore pressure, but for different fluids with different densities. So. Uh, as I said, in some formations, uh, typically pore pressure goes above the uh, the normal pore pressure for the different reasons. Uh, here, there is a very good summary of the of different mechanisms of uh, pore pressure, basically overpressure zone development. Uh, overpressure might be due to mechanical, basically uh, mechanisms, thermal mechanisms, chemical mechanisms. Uh, dynamic actually mechanisms, uh, fluid actually moving from one formation to another one, the formations be being constrained and uh, uh, un in undrained condition. So uh, as you see, there, there are many actually different mechanisms uh, influencing the uh, overpressure basically generation. Uh, but uh, there are actually a few of them that I want to uh, discuss here, which are the most important uh, mechanism behind this basically phenomena. Uh, one is uh, basically under compaction, which is uh, under the stress generated mechanism. So, uh, and then uh, thermally generated uh, mechanism, uh, overpressure is, is the second one. Uh, there are also, I mean, other mechanisms which are uh, related to the fluid distribution or redistribution in the subsurface, like buoyancy effect, like centroid effect, and, and so on, lateral thrown transfer. But let's talk about the two most important mechanisms. So imagine we have a, you know, uh, a media with, with basically uh, 
solid rock and fluid inside it. And this uh, media or this basically space is, is communicating, is drained, it's communicating with, with the next basically uh, for uh, next media. So uh, in this case, typically we have the normal stress. Now imagine we close this basically space here. So it means that the fluid cannot really uh, get drained out of the space. Uh, now imagine we increase the the load or stress on, on, on this basically uh, space. So what happens, the volume, because of the, you know, uh, over stressing the, uh, the space we will uh, will reduce. And due to this effect, according to the physical rules, the pore pressure increases, right? Because there's no way for fluid to get out of this space. So then, I mean, if, if you are dealing with a formation with a very low permeability, tight formations, uh, typically these uh, mechanisms happens and pore pressure uh, will increase in the formation. Now, on top of this, imagine we increase the temperature as well, right? So again, fluid expands, but it cannot really get out of the, the space. So the pressure goes up again, right? So we will have more basically abnormal pressure added to the pore pressure profile. So uh, this mechanism, the first one is called under compaction and the second one is basically fluid expansion due to temperature. I would say majority of the overpressure zones around the world are mainly due to these two mechanisms. Now, how we can measure or, or predict pore pressure, right? Uh, There are actually uh, measurement methodologies. So if, if a formation is flowing, it means it has permeability. So you can, uh, you can measure pore pressure using different uh, methodologies like DST testing, you know, RFT, MDT. Uh, these are different tests that you can basically uh, test the formation with and measure actually pore pressure. Uh, but as I said, it, it is only possible to do this test uh, in permeable formations, in formations like shale or other tight formations, because uh, getting flow out of the formation takes a lot of time. So typically in oil and gas industry, we don't have that much time to do the measurement in those formations. So uh, what we have to do, we have to do prediction. So when we talk about pore pressure prediction uh, and the methodologies that I'm going to explain, we are specifically talking about shale. So these techniques are not applicable to other formations. Just keep that in mind. Uh, they're for shale and they're specifically for, you know, uh, pure or clean shale. Uh, to do prediction, uh, first of all, there are many indicators of pore pressure that we will review in this course. Uh, basically it indicates or indicators that shows uh, we might be in, in pore pressure, uh, over pressure zone. Uh, there's a technique called normal compaction trend line methodology that we, uh, we typically use to predict pore pressure. And uh, another technique called equivalent effective estrus methods. So I, I, will, I will explain actually uh, both these models. There are also more sophisticated methodologies like basin modeling like or forward modeling. So just creating the, the basin from the, uh, from the you know, generation time from back from you know, geologic time that the basin was developed and uh, come forward, uh, basically simulate all the uh, geological basically uh, processes that happened during the history and let's see, I mean, how the pore pressure has been developed basically in the field. It's a time consuming and, you know, uh, cumbersome basically uh, methodology. So uh, if we have access or we have time to do this type of analysis, is they are preferred. Otherwise we just stick to this more simple and quicker methodologies. So pore pressure prediction can be done uh, pre-drilling before we drill. We, we really need to have that before we start drilling. We need to estimate what would be the pore pressure uh, along the basically profile of the well. We can also do wide drilling estimation. So uh, we can uh, identify risks uh, during the drilling uh, in real time. So uh, it's, it's very valuable basically type of technology that we have these days. 
So let's start with the indication indicators, right? So if you are drilling into uh, uh, into the subsurface formations, and all of the sudden we see actually increase in in rate of penetration, it might be related to the properties of the formations. It might be to several other parameters with which, uh, but it might be actually uh, due to increase in the uh, in the pore pressure, right? Gas show. Uh, another indicator of you no know, high pore pressure. So, uh, because you know when the pore pressure is high, it, it pushes the gas from the formation toward the well. So we see extra gas show. Uh, we, we we might get actually extra uh, cuttings and cavings because of the pore pressure. I mean, uh, the the stability of the well will be basically. Uh, less so uh, there's more likely to, to generate more basically cuttings and cavings uh, but the type of cuttings or cavings coming out of you know uh, high pore pressure zones are different from uh, basically uh, zones that formation is rock uh, is weak and, and uh, failed so we call them splintery i will show you in a few seconds uh, what's the geometry of these cavings so by increasing pore pressure, uh, typically the, the flow line temperature increases, the, the chlorides content increases, and the travel time increases because the higher the pore pressure, the, uh, the bigger the uh, pore spaces in the rock. So uh, travel time is, velocity is basically lower, so travel time increases. But in, in high pore pressure zones, uh, typically density decreases, resistivity decreases, and uh, the exponent is basically a log that uh, uh, is, is generated by combining different drilling parameters. And this is, can be actually used as an indicator uh, of, of pore pressure. It typically decreases with increasing pore pressure. So these are all indicators. They, they, they don't give us any, basically, uh, information about magnitude of the, the, of the pore pressure. So, and, and they're not... I mean, any single of any single indicator is not foolproof of pore pressure. It might be due to any other basically reasons. But if, if we have several of them uh, at the same time, that kind of proof uh, there is a, we are entering a overpressure zone, then uh, uh, that is a good basically proof of uh, being in a poor, higher pore pressure zone. These are the type of splintery basically. Cuttings, cavings that coming out of uh, an overpressure zone. <clears throat> As you see, they are they are long, they are flaky, and they have like this uh, concave surfaces. If you look at them from the uh, top view, uh, the blocky and angular or tab tabular but shape of uh, basically cavings are more related to the failure of formations around the wellbore because formation is weak. So. Here is basically the mechanisms that uh, create these splintery cuttings. We call them uh, extensile, basically uh, formation failure. Uh, you know that you know when we drill a well, uh, there is a there is a damage zone around the wellbore where the rocks get weaker, and if the pore pressure is high, so it can easily push uh, uh, this this uh, yielded zone and and basically uh, produce uh, splintery cuttings uh, cavings. Uh, the blocky ones are basically due to sheer failure of the formations. Remember, uh, first session we talked about different mechanisms of failure, and we talked about shear failure, uh, tensile failure, extensile failure, and com compression, basically. So this, these are mainly due to the shear failure. So they, are, they don't correspond to the pore pressure, basically. These are now field example of uh, blocky versus the splintery cuttings. So if you are now oper operation geologist, you are uh, at the well site and you are monitoring the, uh, the cavings, basically the geometry of them can tell you if, if, if you are in an overpressure zone or not. So moving from indicators to basically prediction. Uh, there is an assumption behind uh, pore pressure prediction. It's a very simplified um, assumption, not always 
not very scientific and not always true, right? Uh, the assumption is that as we go deeper and deeper, formations get more compacted, right? So it means that the porosity should decrease, you know, by depth. Uh, it means that the, 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 the velocity should, should increase with depth. So therefore the uh, travel time should, should basically decrease. Uh, resistivity should, should increase with, with depth because the rock's getting compacter. Um, and of course the density, right? Um, you know, in rock mechanics community, it is very valid actually assumption if you're talking about plastic materials like soil, right? But uh, all we know that the rocks are matrix supported material. So it means uh, uh, we might go deep and see that, okay, sandstone is getting more compacted, but all of a sudden we, we reach you now a high uh, porosity, uh, low density sandstone, which might be actually a good reservoir, right? It's because, because I mean, the pore has been kept by the by the strength of the uh, matrix of the rock, right? So uh, this is why this methodology, as I said, is, is just applicable to the shale and uh, clean shale because shales are the closest type of rock to to soil. So they're more, I mean, typically more plastic than than other formations like carbonate or sandstone. So this is why we don't use this methodology is for you know. Uh, sandstone and, and carbonate. So please make sure that uh, when before you do pore pressure, uh, you exclude all the lithologies that are not uh, basically clean shale. So what does it mean? It means that if we log a shale and we're going deeper and deeper, there is a normal trend to this to some of the properties like density, like uh, travel time or velocity and resistivity. Mm -hmm. If there is deviation, from these trend lines in a formation, it is related to pore pressure. This is a, another assumption because, as you know, it, it, I mean, changes to these properties might be due to you know rock composition, the rock porosity, and, and um, maybe many others you know, other parameters. But in the pore pressure community, the assumption is that we can basically relate this deviation from normal trend to a, a high or too low pore pressure, right? So basically, if we, we are looking at different logs, right, and we see a deviation from normal trend, right, in all of them, it basically kind of proved that we are at top of a, uh, an overpressure zone, okay? So, so far, we have been able to identify the overpressure zone, but how much overpressure we, we are actually in this, this formation now? So there are several uh, methodologies that have been developed by, by different, basically, researchers. And most of these, uh, basically, methodolo methodologies are really old. They're, they're back for, I mean, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, and since then, they have not been that much uh, advances in pore pressure prediction, uh, prediction unfortunately. Uh, people are still uh, using these this old methods. Uh, of course, there are many research uh, and development going on, but uh, nothing has been really publicly available. And, uh, uh, commercially available for people to use right now. So the, the, the most simple people is, is called ratio method. And it, it says that, you know, the ratio between the, uh, between the a log reading, a log that we acquire in the, in the well, and the normal trend, right? Because for each area or each location, we can basically estimate the uh, normal trend. What would be the normal trend if there is no overpressure zone, right? So the ratio between the log and the, and the normal trend is equivalent to the ratio between the normal pore pressure and the actual pore pressure that we have in the field, right? So delta T, I mean, uh, for example, th this is using sonic log, the first equation. So we have the log, right, reading, we have the normal trend, we know what is the normal pore pressure, so the, the only unknown is, is the uh, so, sorry uh, the, the p here is the is the actual pressure and the p hydrostatic is basically the normal pressure. So the only unknown is the pore pressure. So we can calculate. It. We can use density log or resistivity log or the uh, dx component. 
uh, log to basically do this type of simple and uh, uh, simple method, basically poor pressure prediction, right? But what was missing here is the effect of depth, because we know that this, this basically ratio, this relationship should change with the depth. It's not physically actually uh, correct to, to use such a simple uh, just ratio between these parameters. So for this reason, uh, other basically uh, uh, researchers uh, suggested other you know, equations that include either uh, depth or vertical stress. For example, Ethan, which is one of the most basically commonly used uh, for pressure prediction uh, methods, uh, he added the S, which is the vertical stress or overburden stress. And he suggested his for formula as, you know, pore pressure is equivalent to the vertical stress minus the uh, vertical stress minus hydrostatic stress, normal, uh, normal pore pressure, right? If, if we assume that, now we are in the, the normal stress, uh, basically pore pressure regime, multiply by the, the ratio between the log reading to the normal compaction trend, okay? And of course, uh, there is a calibration basically exponent here, it's called Eaton exponent that uh, in different regions, this, this number uh, might be actually significantly different. For example, going from the North Sea to Gulf of Mexico to Asia Pacific, you have to calibrate this uh, calibration basically exponent uh, using indicators in the field, uh, the experience that you had in the offset wells during drilling. So again, you can use either resistivity log or sonic log. Uh, the, uh, I believe there is an equation for density log as well. Uh, but this way, basically, you can calculate the pore pressure because all the components are known except the, the pore pressure. The third uh, method, which geomechanically is more basically valid and scientific, is, is called equivalent vertical effective stress. Uh, in this methodology, again, we have a normal trend, exactly like the uh, previous methods, and we have a log. This is the actual log. So we are talking about velocity log here, okay? So as you see in some sections, the, logs, uh, the log doesn't follow the trend line, but uh, I think you are all agree with me that any point in the log, right, any point on the, on the, on the log correspond to a point on the trend line, right? It's valid on, on basically any, any points here. So what, what does it mean based on the compaction theory? It means that since these two different depths are having the same velocity, it means that they are under the same compaction condition. It means that effective stress at point A is equivalent to point B. And you remember effective stress was the total stress minus pore pressure of course, there was a biofactor as well. So what does it mean? It means that if we have a, a vertical stress component, right, overburden stress, and at this point, we know that the norm, uh, pore pressure is normal, so there's the normal pore pressure trend, we can easily calculate the effective stress. So overburden stress minus pore pressure, right? And since we know that at point B, we have the same effective stress, so we just need to you know, do over, overburden minus effective stress and it gives us pore pressure, right? So we can do this for actually every point in, the, uh, in different depth and calculate the pore pressure. Okay, so at the end of the day, if we have the log, <clears throat> like this green log here, we can calculate a pore pressure profile like what you see here. Uh, in very frontier areas where we don't have any logs, what we have seismic data, we can treat the seismic data as a log and, and basically apply the same methodologies and do pore pressure prediction. And we can do pore pre uh, pressure prediction in 3D if we have 3D seismic, so exactly using the same <clears throat> approaches. So in this case, we will have a, a 3D pore pressure model for the whole reservoir or, or the whole field. Okay. So now uh, we are done with the pore pressure. It means uh, another step in the workflow has been completed. The next step is to start stress modeling, 
right? Typically, we start the stress modeling with the vertical or overburden stress because it's, the, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, as far as we have a density log, right? We can basically calculate the vertical stress using this equation. Uh, this equation, I mean, vertical stress, basically the product of density by the, by the depth when it's integrated, right? So uh, if you are, this is the equation at the top for, for offshore cases, but if we have the, no, uh, if you are an onshore and we have the water weight as well, so we need to calculate the water weight and then plus the, uh, the weight of the solid basically, uh, or I mean formations below the, the water. Uh, as you see, all we need to have here is the, is the density log or information about the density of formations. It can be from any sources, even cuttings, right? And uh, uh, G is the gravity, of course, uh, and the water, we just need to have the density of water uh, for C, for example, water, uh, we know what the density is and we can calculate the vertical stress. This is the work workflow to get basically uh, overburden of vertical stress. So we start from uh, a density log, right? So density logs are not always available in the overburden, specifically in the shallow section. So we typically need to estimate the, uh, the density in the, in the uh, shallower sections, right? It can be a form of you no, know, uh, basically extrapolating it, uh, extrapolating it to the surface using a, uh, a mathematical functions, or it might be actually looking at the density of the formation by looking at the cuttings and cavings coming from the formation and, and do the best estimates in this uh, basically interval. So as far as we have this, we can calculate the vertical stress using the equation that I just showed. Uh, this is in absolute pressure uh, unit, and then we convert it to the gradient, which is typically the preferred uh, way to deliver this information to drilling because dr drillers wants to compare these stresses and pore pressure with the mud weight, which is a you know, is in density unit. So this is why we, we, we typically calculate the gradient. So sorry, I have to change this corrected to gra gradient rather than you know, stress gradient. So we call it SV is the vertical stress, SVG is, is the vertical stress gradient. Okay, the next step is to get estimation of the stress orientation because it's quite important actually to optimize the, the well trajectory. For example, the, the fracturing operations, they're all uh, very much uh, dependent on the, the results, uh, dependent on the orientation of the stress. So the first uh, basically place to start uh, looking at the uh, stress orientation in a region is, is, is world stress map. Right. If you go to this website, you will find actually uh, a lot of information. This is a big project that started back in, in the in the eighties, and uh, what, what what was done in this project actually, uh, the research group looked at different measurement of the stress around the world. These data are, might come from mining, from civil engineering projects, or from oil and gas projects, or geothermal projects. They have different depth. Uh, but uh, and methodologies are explained here. They might be actually do, uh, using focal mechanisms uh, or methodology, or they looked at the breakouts. Uh, they looked at you know uh, they they did mini frag, you know uh, hydraulic fracturing tests. Uh, some of them are coming from geological indicator like faults and fractures, and so on. So basically, each methodology is shown basically with a different. Uh, uh, um, symbol here, right? The colors show that which stress regime we are in. And if you remember last time, we talked about normal stress regime, strike asleep and trust or mm -hmm. reverse stress regime. So you can you, you can look at the, the map quickly and see, I mean, if the area you are working on is, is in normal stress and or reverse stress regime. And the length of this line actually show how, uh, how valid the data is because the, the team did a you know, QC on the data and they, def, uh, they basically determined the reliability of each data. So uh, if you go to the website, you can you see actually several maps for region, different regions, like this is for Asia Pacific, right? And you can create your own basically map. You can, you can define your boundary 
of the area you're working on, and then you can just look at the, the data in, inside that area. But the thing is that, you know, uh, S-stress orientation actually varies laterally and with depth, right? So these measurements may, maybe are not the best analog for, for your well or your locations, but at least it's a good indication, a, a indication how the S-stress orientation basically evolved changes you know, around your area. So, stress orientation can be also uh, estimated from uh, faults, right? The major faults in, in regions. Um, the most important basically note here is that if you want to use the geometry of the faults to get the stress orientation, you have to make sure that faults are active in the, in the present day stress, stress regime, stress condition, right? If a fault is not active right now, is basically representing the stress orientation in it now, uh, all geologic time, right? So uh, there, there are techniques that geologists, uh, structural geologists use to basically ad identify if, if, if a fault is active or not. But if the fault is active and the fault is normal, then typically the strike of the fault shows the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress, right? And of course, minimum stress is perpendicular to that. If the fault is reverse, like what you see here, the strike of the fault is showing the orientation of minimum horizontal stress. It's totally opposite the normal. If the fault is strike slip, then the strike of the fault has an acute angle with the with the uh, basically maximum horizontal stress, the largest stress, right? So it, this type of faults don't give you the, the exact orientation of the stress, but just estimation of it, right? So it's an easy basically approach, but uh, there are many other uh, factors that might actually uh, affect the, the stroke or geometry of the fault, like uh, heterogeneity or natural fractures might actually divert the fault from the uh, stress preferred orientations. So you have to do a lot of you know, uh, deep, basically, uh, investigation to make sure that you know, uh, the fault geometry is only affected by the stress condition. But uh, the best sources of information to get uh, stress orientations are borehole failures. Uh, borehole failures, you have seen this slide before. Uh, there are two types of uh, wellbore failures. One is, is called breakout, and the other one is, is called drilling-induced tensile fractures, right? And we explained that when we actually drill a wellbore and remove the, <clears throat> the basically support from the, the formations and replace it with a mud weight that's supposed to actually uh, compensate for part of that, you know, uh, initial support, there's a redistribution of, you know, stress around the wellbore, or we call it hook stress, uh, which basically the maximum uh, compression concentration of stress goes in a vertical well, typically goes to the to the uh, orientation of the minimum horizontal stress. And the minimum hoop stress is typically at the location of the maximum horizontal stress. It means that if, if the rock wants to fail in shear or compression, it will be always at these locations, right? So if we see breakouts, like what you see on the left side uh, of the slide, uh, if we see failures on the wellbore wall, right, uh, on two opposite side of it, which basically shows two breakouts, uh, 180 degree apart, in a vertical way, it, it shows the minimum horizontal stress <coughs> orientation, right? Uh, if, you, if your rail is deviated, it doesn't, I mean, breakouts don't give you the directly the orientation of a stress, but you, you can always back calculate. We have, we have methodologies and models to basically back calculate the stress orientation from deviated and horizontal wells as well. So uh, on the other side, if you have drilling uh, induced tensile fractures, which are tiny, you know, tensile fractures on the wellbore, then it shows the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress. This is a, a very good example of, you know, uh, an image lock Image log is, is an unwrapped, uh, basically, picture of the wellbore surface, right? So there are different uh, technologies that can basically image uh, a wellbore and create what you see here. <clears throat> so 
So as we see these this darker bands or breakouts, they're 180 degree apart and they show the orientation of the uh, minimum, uh, sorry, max uh, minimum horizontal stress. And these tiny little fissures here are drilling induced tensile fractures showing the minimum stress orientation, right? Uh, this is a perfect case actually here, here uh, tip, I mean, we, we might look at the image, images and don't see anything. It means uh, the formation never actually reached the level to, to fail. Uh, sometimes we have only breakouts, sometimes we have only, you know, tensile fractures, and sometimes like this case, we have both of them, which is actually is a perfect case to, to get good estimate of the uh, fracture, uh, uh, stress orientation, okay? This image here is an acoustic image. Uh, acoustic images have a full coverage of the wellbore wall and is preferred for geomechanics. This one is electrical image, which is pad based. So basically there are, there are four or six arm uh, pads that, that go, uh, touches the, the, the rock and basically image uh, that portion. So you see there are gaps actually in the, between the, the pads and uh, sometimes using these uh, images, we, we might actually miss the uh, drilling in distance of fractures, but we, we can easily see the breakouts, right? These are lower resolution, basically, uh, part of the image. So now we have the vertical stress, we have stress orientation. Uh, the next step is to get estimation of the magnitude of the minimum horizontal stress, which is actually a, a very important parameters of in, in the stress model. Typically to measure uh, minimum horizontal stress, we need to frag the formation. Uh, I would say, I mean, in, in the currently available, basically uh, technologies, basically uh, technology access that, that we, we have right now. Uh, fracking the formation might actually uh, be done through different type of fracking tests, right? So, and th these are, I mean, the methodology that we use to basically estimate the stress, there are, there are small size fractures that we create in the formations, not really uh, huge fractures like we do in unconventional resources. So it's not an actual fracturing, but uh, the point, the, the objective here is to, to create a fracture long enough to pass through the hoop stress or damage zone around the wellbore and go to the uh, basically virgin stress area, right? When we get to that point, then we are actually in direct uh, contact with the, with the minimum uh, principal stress, right? And the reason is that fractures typically open perpendicular to the smallest stress because it's just easier to uh, physically and mechanically to, to open a fracture perpendicular to the minimum stress. Okay, different tests include the mini frag, micro frag, hydraulic fracturing, a diffit is a typical test that's uh, in, in shale gas and uh, you know, tight formation, basically formations, uh, is a preferred type of test. Uh, also a step rate test or injectivity test uh, uh, is also used to get the minimum stress. And during drilling, the only test that's available is extended leak of test, right? These tests are all done in the reservoir sections uh, when we have more time and more budget to evaluate the formation. But regardless of what basically what of the test type we are using, the result uh, of the test is a pressure versus volume injected volume type of cross plot. Uh, it shows that how basically the formation react to the to the injection. Right? As we inject more and more fluid, how the rock basically uh, behave. So as you see, uh, typically by injection, uh, formations start elastically deforming, right? So you, it's just you know, elastic reaction of the formation to, to increase to pressurizing, right? And this is reflected in this linear part of the curve, right? As soon as we initiate a little fracture, right? on the surface of the wall, it means we have overcome the, basically the, the tensile strength of the formation plus the hoop stress that is applying to this location of the well. And you know that, you know, this is the, uh, the location where the hoop stress is minimum, right? So the curve gets deviated from linearity, right? 
And this is because we are increasing the volume of the wellbore now. So this point is called a leak up point or leak up pressure. Leak up pressure is the pressure we need to actually initiate a, a small fracture on the surface of the wall. But from this initiation to basically creating a fracture that goes uh, exceed or get out of the, the hoop stress zone around the well bore, we still need to increase the, the pressure inside the well until we get a point that's called uh, fracture breakdown point or the pressure equivalent pressure is fracture breakdown pressure. This is the pressure that is needed for a fracture to get out of the, the basically hoop stress zone or concentrated the stress concentration zone, right? After that, basically the tip of the fracture is already in the virgin stress condition. So there is a drop in the, in the pressure. And then we, I mean, the pressure curve goes, goes to a plain, basically a flat uh, area where it means that, you know, we don't really need to increase the pressure from this number to propagate the fracture, right? Uh, for a small fracture is valid, but if we want to create a larger fractures, it's not 100% uh, true. Uh, but this pres uh, pressure is called fracture propagation pressure, right? Uh, so we continue injection until we, we have a fracture, which is typically uh, up to 10 times larger than the, the, the diameter of the, of the well, uh, to make sure that we, we have reached the, the, the virgin stress. Uh, at this point, we just shut down the pump right? And we monitor the decline curve, right? So decline curve shows uh, the, the characteristics of the fluid uh, going back either to the well or into the formation, right? So the part of the, the fluid that goes to the formations is, is basically, we call it leaked uh, through the formation. And, and but majority of the basic depends on the, the Process permeability of the formation. Typically, a lot of uh, fluid goes back, flow back to the well, right? Well, if we analyze this curve uh, carefully, and there are methodologies like, like G function for analyzing this section, we can get information about uh, minimum horizontal stress, which is this point here. We call it fracture closure pressure, right? Fracture closure pressure is actually the is equivalent to minimum horizontal stress, right? Uh, but I mean, people get uh, poor pressure from uh, this section. They got the tortuosity of the formation around the world board. There are several different information. Typically from, from DFIT tests, we can analyze this section because DFIT uh, tests, we, we actually wa wait long on this uh, decline, right? Until the pressure reaches the poor pressure, right? During drilling, like extended leak of tests, we don't have really time to, to wait uh, enough to get you know all this information, but uh, we typically reach FCP quite uh, quick, so we can get information about the minimum stress. So then remember, if, if you do an extended leak of test or mini frag or diffid test, the only point that basically corresponds to the minimum horizontal stress is FCP. I've seen a lot of people actually use LOP or FPP as minimum stress. It is is a, a totally wrong approach. Okay, so uh, these measurements, as you see, they are basically, they need uh, kind of ex uh, expensive testing. They, they need time. And at the end of the day, they provide uh, one point only. And in one formation, in one depth, you get information about the minimum horizontal stress, right? Which is good. We really push uh, companies to do this type of test to get as FCP for calibration. But what we really need for geomechanics is a continuous you know, profile of SH mean along the well board. How we can get that information? Uh, you know that, you know, if, if think about subsurface, right? We are in a, in a reservoir section, let's say that we have a sandstone or shale or whatever. If we assume each pieces of this reservoir, like a uh, basically a cube, right? And this cube is under overburden stress. You know that it, it deforms axially and it also wants to deform laterally due to the Poisson's effect, right? But the problem is that there is another basically cube of rock constraining this one. So this one cannot deform 
This one cannot deform. So what happens? The S stress develops between these two basically cubes, right? And it, it, it is, is what happens actually in between all of these. So this, this basically theory is called bilateral constraint theory. And uh, it explains how the horizontal stresses are developed actually in a relaxed uh, basin where we have only a vertical stress acting to the uh, acting on the rocks, right? But later on in the, the geological basically time, there are uh, you know, tectonic sources and other basic sources of the perturbation coming to the picture and uh, changes the, the horizontal stresses. But I mean, the base for creating, for uh, developing horizontal stress is basically bilateral constraint uh, due to overburden stress, right? So this equation here actually shows how horizontal stresses develop, right? Uh, horizontal stress is equivalent to the effective stress, effective vertical stress multiplied by a constant we call it the effective stress ratio, right? Plus the pore pressure. And as you know that if the, the deformation property of the formation changes, so this amount of uh, basically horizontal stress developed should change. The more the rock wants to deform, the more horizontal stress basically uh, will be developed. So it means that it, horizontal stress is basically related to the to the formation property. It cannot be independent from the formation. So as you go through the different formation, you see, you should see that the, the horizontal stress basically changes, right? So K, as I explained, is, is actually a rock property uh, related parameter. Some people related to the Poisson ratio, some others to uh, porosity, some others to, to friction angle or friction coefficient of the formation. Um, but overall, when you generate a stress, a stress model in a simple way, as you go through different lithologies, different formations with different properties, the stress should change. It cannot go straight, okay? And it all depends on the you know, stiffness of the formation. The, the stiffer the rock, right? The stiffer the rock, like uh, this case, the lower the stress, right? Because the formation is less, right? But it, if a formation is pure plastic, like salt, saturated salt, you see that, I mean, the the, mini, the, the horizontal stresses actually develop and, uh, a lot and, and reaches the vertical stress. So they, they behave like fluid. All the stresses in this type of formations are basically the same. So these are some of the equations that you can use to develop the minimum horizontal stress. As you see, this one, for example, uh, depends, uh, basically relates as a horizontal stress to Poisson's ratio and B of coefficients, right? This one is for uh, actually the same equation for uh, transverse isotropic uh, material like shale. So in these cases, you have two Young's modulus to Poisson's ratio uh, in different basically perpendicular orientations. And you see bio factor as well. And th this is a, actually another uh, methodology uh, based on proelastic, uh, basically, uh, theory. Uh, all of these actually are, are proelastic uh, base, basically, equations. And in these ones, you see uh, two parameters added to it, which basically try to simulate the tectonic uh, effect on the, on the stress development. So, um, but all of these methodologies needs to be calibrated to the uh, extended Likov test or mini frag, those tests that we actually measure the minimum stress, right? Without uh, calibration, we don't really know how accurate these models are, right? So uh, there are also some models which basically are more related to the friction angle of the formations, right? Uh, I put two of them here. Uh, so it's totally up to you to find the best actually model uh, that works better in your, your area, right? Uh, it, it's not an easy work, so it needs a lot of experience actually to find the best model and then do the a good calibration to, to develop a reliable minimum horizontal stress model. So this is an example, right? So in this case, you see we have developed the pore pressure because pore pressure is input to minimum horizontal stress as, as, as per the equation that I just show you. 
So if you see somebody develops, you know, minimum stress before having a poor pressure model, it is a wrong approach. It means he doesn't really know the, the correct workflow. So as you see, the minimum horizontal stress profile has been developed using the, uh, the rock property is, is, is changing with the lithology with rock property and it's calibrated to the FCP, fracture closure pressure, not the LOT. These points here are LOT. Like a lot of people mistakenly actually use this type of basically calibration. Uh, and a lot of people in the industry are still using this very simple smooth models, which are not basically uh, dependent on the, on the lithology. These, these are totally, uh, I would say wrong models uh, because they don't identify all the risks during drilling, which are related to the formation. Uh, and these models are typically developed by, by fitting a curve into field LOT data or FIT data, right? This is one of those basically wrong models, example of wrong models that are really simple. They don't show the uh, changes in the stress profile and they are basically fit to a few measurements that we do in the, in the field and you know, they extrapolate it all the way to the surface. Uh, this is very risky to, to use this type of models because it cannot really tell us what, what, what type of risks we are facing when drilling these formations, okay? It was my last slide, uh, so I'm ready to answer the questions. Next session, we, we go to the maximum horizontal stress estimation, and then we go to uh, some applications like well -board stability and hydraulic fracture. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. The session was very inform informative and clear. We have collected some questions. I hope we can cover most of them. Uh, first question, uh, how is chloride linked to pore pressure increase? Yeah, that, that's actually a good question. Uh, you know, the, uh, the sources of chlorides are typically the formation. And the higher the pore pressure, it's easier for chloride to actually get into the well through the, the, for, uh, the basically flow that comes from the formations, right? Uh, so typically, if, if you are using a constant mud weight and you go from uh, a normal pressure zone to a high pressure zone, you see increase in the chloride because now there, there are more flow from the formation to the to the well. Okay, great. Uh, next question, how to calibrate Eaton uh, exponent based on which data? Yes, based on uh, drilling experiences. For example, if, if you are drilling in a, in a, in a, through a for several formation and all of a sudden you get kicks, you get blowouts, you get extra, basically you, you start seeing the uh, splintery cuttings, right? So you're, Poor pressure model should show that. If, if your model is far from showing, you know, uh, for example, a kick event, it means you have to change the, the Eaton component to better match the, this, this event, this incident during drilling, right? So drilling experience is, is actually a very important source of calibrating geomechanical models, right? And we, I will uh, talk more about it when we talk about wellbore well stability. Okay, uh, how can we ensure the orientation from acoustic image log, log since we cannot ensure the rotation of the logging tool? Um, the logging tool is oriented. So we exactly know what is the, uh, what is the north and what is the uh, basically pad azimuth, right? So if you are talking about uh, electrical tool, about acoustic tool, again, the tool is totally oriented, right? We know where's the, the north, where's the south, where's the west, where's the east, right? And then based on that, we can basically get the orientation of the, of the breakouts or tensile fractures. Okay, uh, what does the hoop stress zone mean? Okay, I think the first session I talked about it, uh, you know, when, when we drill a well, we, we basically dis disturb the the, the virgin stress condition. So the stress reorient, redistribute around the well bore, right? And this redistribution actually creates two opposite parts of the uh, well uh, more compressed and the other two opposite less compressed or maybe in, uh, put it in tension, right? So that, that basically uh, that tangential stress around the well bore, which is different from the virgin stress, that's called hoop stress, right? You, you can we can refer back to the first session basically the video and, and look, uh, I mean 
but but I will I will talk more about it in web well stability again. Okay, and the last question: Why there is need of logging data? Can't we directly work with the lab laboratory data calibration data? The answer is no, because as I said, uh, calibration data are are individual points. Uh, I mean, sometimes you get only one point along the whole well interval. Sometimes you get 10 points or so on, right? We need to have a, a basically continuous profile of rock properties and the stresses along the well, right? This is why we, we put the base of our model uh, on logs and then we calibrate them to the uh, basically either lab data or measurements. And those are very expensive. You cannot do testing or measurement along the well, uh, like doing thousands of measurements. The, the, those are expensive. So. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. We really appreciate your time and your efforts. And thank My you pleasure. all. Then the lecture will be uploaded to Pi Petro YouTube channel. And don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. Best of luck and thank you again. Thank you, everyone.